This stuff in life seems so unfair, and why do certain things happen to some people? But God is good, and he works in levels that we don't understand, and he's doing things in our family's life that uh, would not happen otherwise. So if you're going through some rough time, I just want to encourage you. It may not look like it or feel like it, but God is good. He loves you all the time, and he is with you. Uh, I encourage you to grab your outline out of the bulletin. We're in the Gen Next series where God is saying to us, I will be with you. It was all through his leadership with Moses, through Moses to Israelites, and now with Joshua. You're going to go do this and don't be afraid, for I, the Lord your God, will be with you wherever you go. And so we are learning about that. We're learning about the dynamics of that. And today is a tough lesson in that for us as we're in this journey. Uh, but on the back side of that, there's supplemental information as well for a personal study or for being in a community group. So grab that outline. Be ready to follow along today. This is our last Sunday. You'll see if you've been faithful in writing your journey in your bookmark, this is the last space we have on the bookmark. Now, we're going to go through Joshua up until Advent this year, almost, uh, pretty close, and uh, actually up to almost Thanksgiving. And, uh, but yet, this is the last blank on your bookmark. So if you've had that in your Bible, if not, can I, I forgot again with my back and trying to stay rested to save my irritation, <laughs> the irritation, inflammation for the preaching. Um, isn't that great? You're going to be hearing from an inflamed and irritated pastor. Um, ushers, if we can make, does anyone need a bookmark? I forgot to ask them to be ready, but does anyone need a bookmark? Doesn't have yours with you today? want to make sure everyone has it. This is the last Sunday we need to ask for that special thing. I hope you'll have them. I think we all got them, Neil. I don't see anybody that needs it. Oh, we need one. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sorry about that, Ernie. Neil, thank you for covering for me a little bit there. Um, and so there's, there's the bookmark for you. Uh, I went a little backwards there, Steve. Sorry. But we're ready to go to the title slide. Today is a little play on words. It's, it's not a typo. Uh, in fact, you'll see the quotes around the word to try to tell you this is intentional. That the body is aching. I just thought it was, I mean, yesterday when I'm buckling and falling to the ground and Amy's like, are you, how are you going to preach tomorrow? You can't even stand up. And I mean, I couldn't. And I was like, well, I don't know, but it's ironic. I'm supposed to preach on the body aching. And, and here is my body aching. And, you know, I, I told Cole this morning, I, I pray, Lord, please help me practice what I preach. <laughs> well, this is a little ridiculous, but either Satan's... Either Satan is trying to stop the message or God's enabling me to practice what I preach and the body's aching today. All right. But we're going to get through it. Um, and in this journey here, you'll see the, a theme verse that, that or just this starting verse for us in this whole chapter. We're going to read through the whole thing in chunks. We're going to take it a little bit out of order today. But in there where we're looking at why is the body is aching, why is it that title, the body's aching? Well, in one point in verse 13, God is telling Joshua you cannot stand against your enemies. That's what I just thought was so funny. After typing that in this PowerPoint presentation Friday night, Saturday I could not stand. <laughs> and, and yet, so, wow, we've been in such a rich and a powerful journey and the promises of God, and yet we're coming to this place in their journey where God says, guess what? You can't stand against your enemies. Something has gone wrong. Dreadfully, wouldn't you say? And so let's, let's explore that today. My knees buckled yesterday, and Israel's knees were buckling. But, you know, it was, they were on such a roll. You know, nothing, what we want to start with, and where Israel was, as we pick up this journey in Joshua 7, is nothing is stopping us. Nothing. Israel has been on a winning streak. We have been celebrating what happens when God's power is flowing, and he's leading his people, and they're following him, and, and they're obeying him. And they've had their struggles with obedience in the desert. They've paid some dear prices, but they've been on this crazy wind streak. I mean, they've been like the U.S. Postal Service. Nothing's going to stop us from delivering the mail. Rain, sleet, snow, hail, internet, <laughs> emailing. Nothing's going to stop us. I mean, listen to what they've been on in this winning streak. And, and I'd say if it was a sports term, they've got a little momentum going. They've got a little winning streak going, and it's pretty incredible. They've, they've seen the Red Sea that was a big barrier part in front of them. They've seen it swallow up the mighty Egyptian army that had them in captivity and slavery for so many years. They've been wandering out in the desert with the harshness of the desert sun, but yet this cloud of provision and shade by day. They've been in the desert every night for 40 years in the desert cold. When it's cold in the desert, it's cold, and they've had a pillar of fire to light and to warm. And, and they have had the barrenness of the desert, no vegetation, no food, but yet they've had quail and manna and water from a rock. 
This is quite a winning streak, wouldn't you say? These are some miraculous comebacks. They've had mighty armies that would not let them pass through their territory, even when Moses asked politely. And Moses said, well, if you ain't going to be nice, neither I'm not going to play nice either. And they wipe out these mighty armies. And here's this desert generation that is having to be nomadic and travel kind of light. All that they're packing up is their tents and the tabernacle and, and all that stuff. And, and not really battle, battle ready, but God has delivered mighty armies into their hands. They come to another water barrier of the Jordan River at flood stage that they've heard the God of Baal, of the, the Canaanites, uh, that, that he was the God of water and maybe that God was opposed to them, but that went just gone for 16 mile stretch and they crossed the Jordan and then they've come to Jericho. Just last week we came to the city that was fortified. It was in its most defensive position. The army's all on the wall. The king, they're all contained in this thing in their most defensive, protective position. And God said, look, I've given it to you. And we talked about how that was the enemy wrapped in a bow. And the walls fell. And there was the whole city of Jericho nicely and contained in this neat package. And when it fell, take it. It's yours for the taking. I would say that's been quite a winning streak. So nothing is stopping us. Israel's on this winning streak, and now we come to this place in the journey. The next little piece of land is, is lived in by the people of Ai. And Ai ain't, ain't going to stop us. We see in this passage of Scripture in chapter 7 that little old Ai, well, surely they ain't going to stop us. No Jordan, no Red Sea, Egyptian army, come on. There's only a few thousand that live in Ai. In fact, that's what happens in this passage of Scripture in verses 2 to 3, the segment you have listed there by your blanks. And here's what they'll say. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai and told them, go up and spy out the region. So the men went up and spied out Ai. When they returned to Joshua, they said, ah, not all the army will have to go up against Ai. Send two or three thousand men to take it. And do not worry, weary the whole army, for only a few people live there. Yeah, it's this little dinky thing. I mean, with what God's led us through, nothing's stopping us. We've had incredible victories. This is just a little speed bump. Just send a few thousand, and it's not going to be a problem. So surely, they're not going to stop us. And then all of a sudden, Joshua had to stop and ask, Lord, what is stopping us? What's going on? Listen to this. So about 3,000 went up, but they were routed by the men of Ai, who killed about 36 of them. Now, that doesn't sound that bad in that kind of warfare, but it, it was beating them bad. And, and here's where it got embarrassing. These, these, this little piddly group from Ai chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries and struck them down on the slopes. At this, the hearts of the people melted. And this is Israel. Remember what happened when Israel came in the power of God and was waiting to cross the Jordan and the spies talked to Rahab? She said all their leaders were melted in fear because of what they've heard God had done among the Israelites. So here's all this power that had the, the pagan culture melted in fear because of seeing the power of God. And now here's the people of God melted in fear because of a little band of men from a little land called Ai that kind of kicked their hineys and chased them away, running. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there till evening. The elders of Israel did the same and sprinkled dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring this people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? If only we had been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan. Pardon your servant, Lord. What can I say now that Israel has been routed by its enemies? The Canaanites and the other people of the country will hear about this, and they will surround us and, and wipe out our name from the earth. What then will you do for your own great name? So Joshua is confused. We've been on this roll, and, and nothing has stopped us. And now what? And, and now we're going to be the laughing stock. Now that all that fear is gone, the enemy's going to come. They're going to hear that I wiped us out. They're going to know something's wrong, and that we're vulnerable, and they're going to come, and they're going to wipe us out. God, and your name is going to be wiped out. So 
Joshua was asking that question, what, what is it, Lord, that's stopping us? Well, Israel was Achan, A-C-H-I-N apostrophe, because of Achan, A-C-H-A-N. Achan is an individual in the army of Israel and a family leader, head of his household. And so Joshua is going to discover the whole nation is hurting and cannot stand against its enemies because of this one individual, because of Achan. Here's what happened. I know it's a lot of scripture, but it says it better than I can. And there's details we need to hear that I won't take time to develop. But the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. This is back in chapter, verse 1. Achan, son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of them. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. The Lord said to Joshua, stand up. What are you doing down on your face? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have lied. They have stolen. They have lied. They have put them with their own possessions. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. Now we know where that verse came from. This is why Israel on a winning streak is being stopped. And why they cannot stand against their enemies. Why their knees are buckling. They turn their backs and run because they've been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. There are devoted things among you, Israel. You cannot stand against your enemies until you remove them. Achan replied, It's true. I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I have done. When I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and I took them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. So we have the confrontation and the confession. Israel has been unfaithful with the devoted things. Back in chapter 6, God was speaking to them as they were getting ready to take Jericho. And in verses 18 to 19, he said, But keep away from the devoted things, so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Now, does God love us enough to warn us? Before they go, God says, Make sure you don't take any of these things, or you'll be making yourself liable to destruction. What did he say after they took some of those things? You've made yourself liable to destruction. We don't like to hear those warnings. Sometimes we don't like to follow them. And then we get mad at God for the results. But God loves us enough to warn us and then to be just. Otherwise, you'll make the camp of Israel liable to destruction for bringing trouble and bring trouble on it. All the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. Now, the treasury was used for a number of things, but you know what used to happen when they would take a city like that is those metal objects became things they could melt down and make more weapons and be ready to take the next, you know, like, like we jumped along the Marshall Islands and we, we make forward air bases and we kept just kind of swallowing up and started utilizing the land that we took as forward air bases and, and started marching and, and fighting a, a mighty army. Back in our U.S. military history, they, they would take a piece of land and everything became theirs. And, and the, the people would become slaves that would help melt the stuff and make the stuff and sharpen the stuff. They, they would put them into slave labor to make the war machine go. Instead of Rosie the Riveter doing it voluntarily, they had all this manpower that was slaves. And get to work. We have conquered you. You are ours. Make, to melt all this stuff into new weapons for us because we got another land to go take. That's how you moved in those days. And Israel's coming out of the desert. This is, this is their first conquest that they have now on this side of the Jordan, some stuff to use to take the land. And God says, give it to me. Trust me. This could be your best foot forward, humanly, logically thinking, to get all this stuff and make yourself a war machine. But I want you, I gave this to you. I want you to trust me that I'll give you the rest. You give me Jericho. So they had to trust him. 
And he said that about those devoted things. And the body, Israel, was Achan because of Achan. The people of God, all of them, 36 men died. The rest of them got laughed at, running away from a little, little troop of men from Ai. And, and their name was vulnerable to disrespect and laughability in the culture. Because they claimed this power and Ai beat them. <laughs> what are you kidding? That's like the angels beating the Dodgers. <laughs> just thought I'd say that for those angels fans in here. Sorry, just kidding. I have a few people I'm watching to see. Don't get up and leave, Peggy. Don't you get up and leave. All right. Okay. So, to stop the Aiken, we got to stop the Aiken, quote unquote. <laughs> to stop the aching in the body, we've got to stop the spirit of Aiken, the man, the activity of Aiken, the man. God said to stop. And here's a long passage, well, several pieces, verses 13 to 15, verse 19, verses 22 to 26. Sorry about that. I just felt led to piece these together in this sequence. Here's what God says. Go consecrate the people. Tell them, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow. In the morning, present yourselves. You shall come forward family by family. Whoever's caught with the devoted thing shall be destroyed by fire along with all that belongs to him. He has violated the covenant of the Lord and has done an outrageous thing in Israel. Then Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and honor him. Tell me what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And that's where Joshua said what we quoted. Verse 22, So Joshua sent messengers. They ran to the tent, and there it was, hidden in his tent, with the silver underneath. They took the things from the tent, brought them to Joshua and all the Israelites, and spread them out before the Lord. Then Joshua, together with all Israel, took Achan, son of Zerah, the silver, the robe, the gold bar, his sons and daughters, his cattle, donkeys and sheep, his tent, and all that he had to the valley of Achor, Achan and Achor. Joshua said, why have you brought this trouble on us? The Lord will bring trouble on you today. Then all Israel stoned him, and after they had stoned the rest... They burned them. Boy, this is a happy message on this Sunday, isn't it? Over Achan they heaped up a large pile of rocks which remains to this day. Then the Lord turned from his fierce anger. Therefore that place has been called the Valley of Achor ever since. I've, I've shared this with you that as we're walking through this, it just amazes me that I, I, I know Christ I know the new covenant. That's how I've come to know God is this love and this graciousness. And we know that he's a mighty judge and we know that he's just. And it's been so hard reading through the Old Testament to reconcile this. Slaughter the women and children. Slaughter the animals. Burn them. And you notice they were dead before they burned them. But it, it's grotesque and it's harsh. And it's, but as, as I've said, as I've been reading, what what the enemies have done to them and, and, and what they've done to God, what they've done in pagan worship. We, my, our community group is watching a series on the Holy Land and we're looking at where the, the Baal worship, did you know that included moms would bring their babies and burn them alive on the altar of Baal to hope to, that the blood would help arouse Baal to have sex with Asherah, which would then give fertility to the land and make their crops grow. So moms were bringing their babies and sacrificing them on the altar, and Israel mixed in with this. When they did not wipe these people out of the land, Israel mixed in with it, and they, during the week, would be at the high place worshiping Baal and hoping that Baal will bless their crops while they go to the temple on Sunday and act like, okay, God, we're your people. And God was like, ah! you go and sacrifice your children to other gods and come and defile my house? And so, Old Covenant, sin was ugly, and it only had an ugly solution. And that's why God loved us so much. He took that ugly solution on himself. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, turn the other cheek. And that's the covenant you and I get to enjoy and live in the message of love and grace and yet still the same power if we are obedient and faithful with the devoted things. What are the devoted things? 
In my reading this week, I just came across, well, in one of my devotionals, Max John Maxwell, Promises for Leaders. He was talking about the verse that says, you as living stones are being built together into a holy priesthood. As you come to him, you're being built together. Now, I, I have mispreached this before because I, I, I've, I've tried to lift up how stones they'd make into a wall. You kind of find the ones. When we did this silly little altar, I sat in my office and kind of stacked them to see which ones would fit better. And there's little marker numbers on them that I had lined up. So when we stacked it here, okay, I give right number one to the first one. Number two, put that here, put that here. There was a little bit of strategy going on in setting this silly little thing up. And, and building a wall out of all these different shape, misshapen stones, you know, it understands the difference in the variety and, and God would put them together with the mortar that would help hold them. But, but I, I had misspoken in looking at that variety because the word for stone that is used in that wall in Peter is lithos, not Petra. And Petra is that rough rock which Peter was called. But Peter became a lithos. See, lithos refers to, refers to the cut, hewn, shaped stones that they would use for like temple walls. The wailing wall that still today has little bits of weed growing through the cracks, but how those things are so seamless and so tight with the technology they didn't have back then. But these stones that were being shaped and cut to fit together into a mighty, enduring house of worship and praise and the glory of God on the earth. And, and so it's not just we come and let them throw us together the way we were shaped, but it is us coming and saying, God, shape me, mold me, cut me. You make me fit in to the building that you want I offer myself to you. That's why we talk about clay on the potter's wheel. Shape me, mold me. That's so warm, and you see people get a little bit of water, and it's shiny, and it makes a little line. And you hear, you hear the Righteous Brothers song start coming on in the background as you're shaping this pot of clay. Sorry, that's from the movie Ghost. For most of you, you may not even know that. Um, am I right? Was it the Righteous Brothers? Was it that song? I don't even know if that's right. But it's just the soft music. Oh, shape me, mold me, fill me, use me. Oh, that, yeah, we can all get with that. But this is shaping that is cutting and sawing and are we really submitted to God to allow him to build us into his building see we're built together Peter's telling us which means we have a responsibility to each other a responsibility for each other the devoted things now all of me and if you're a believer, all of you, all of you, there's nothing that belongs to you anymore as a devoted follower of Christ. God's word calls us to be living sacrifices. The dead sacrifice didn't get to walk away. The dead sacrifice had no more life <laughs> because it was consumed either eaten by the proper people or burned. It was, it was gone. And God says, now, I, I don't want this, I, I want to use you, but be a living sacrifice, that there's nothing of you left for you. It's, it's for the kingdom. You belong to me. See, and yesterday, when that little tiny nerve in my back, I don't know how big that sciatica nerve is. Del Anderson may know because he's probably seen it in diagrams every time he's visited. I, I, little tiny nerve. I tried to get up to help my wife clean up for a meeting she had and fell to the ground. That little tiny thing, not functioning the way it's supposed to, my whole body couldn't do anything. I had to go lay in bed. One part hurt, it hindered my whole body. My knees ache because I've had no cartilage in them since college and two knee surgeries, and I can't chase after my own kids. So my whole body's hindered by parts of my body not being where they're supposed to be and working the way they're supposed to and doing what they're supposed to do. Am I the only one in the church that's 51 and older and feels this in my physical body? Anyone else feeling that with me? Something's not quite working. It's hindering your whole body? All right. You youngins, you're going to feel it one of these days. Trust me. You think you're sore after working out. Just wait until you're old. So what is all of me? It's three things that you've heard before, I'm sure. Time, talent, and treasure. Those three things tend to embody 
the total essence, uh, the total things that we have in our possession and, and, and choice, responsibility, which in essence becoming followers, we become stewards of them. All my time is God's. All my talents are God's. And my treasure is not mine. It's His. I have become a living sacrifice, and everything in my possession now is a part of that. I don't get to take any. I could be, I should be, that lamb on the altar that's dead, toast, eaten, and burnt, and gone. And God says, nope, I love you, and I want relationship with you. Be a living sacrifice. Well, I'll take that alternative. How about you? So time, talent, and treasure. As we get to the time, let's look at, look at time. How do we bring our time as a devoted thing to the Lord and put it before Him? Well, two things that came to mind, fellowship and service. Fellowship and service. Time is becoming almost harder than finances in our world these days because of dual income families, both having to work, crazy schedules. How do you get consistent in a community group when you got to work late this night or work late that night and you don't know when you're going to and you miss it half the time? When, but, but your time needs to be brought. And only you, as Ernie said, only you can walk away from the Lord. Only you can make decisions that show your priorities of your heart and your time belongs to God, and we manifest it to Him through fellowship and service. Fellowship, Scripture says, you've heard it many times, do not give up meeting together, but gather together and encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. We need this fellowship. We need to encourage each other. Scripture says, come together and confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. And it's easy to get on the prayer chain and say, have pastor pray for me. I'm struggling with this. Thank you. And then, then there's this, you know, weird E connection, but a distance and a safety. But God's Word says get together as the body of believers. Chew on the Word and fellowship. Speak the truth to each other in love. Do you hear that? God's saying you need to get in each other's kitchens. And you need to let other people in your kitchen. And yet today, we're not cutting out the time to let God shape us by being involved in fellowship around his word. And in service, I've used this verse, it's already in scripture, and I've referred to it, you are not your own. You've been bought with a price. And that passage is talking about, would you join your body with prostitutes now that you know it's a temple of the living God? <laughs> You're not your own. You've been bought for a price. But that is what this, what, what does the service mean? Well, it tells us in several other chapters that when you become part of Christ, you become a part of his body. And the hand cannot say to the foot, you don't need me. I don't need to be with you. You don't need me. Satan is one of the great liars that wants to tell you you have nothing to offer the body that's worthwhile. And for many of you, we as a body have no idea what we are sorely missing because you are not serving with your gifts and abilities. We have no idea. But every single one of you has that, and you belong to the body, and your time is not your own. Take some stands at work. Prioritize God. See what happened with Israel when they prioritized God? And see what happened with Israel when they prioritized their human logic and fear? You want to walk in the power and you want us to be a powerful body of Christ, we've got to be living sacrifices with our time through fellowship and service of the body. We need you. Talents. As far as talents, those two things that I would capsulate in that would be abilities and spiritual gifts. They're two different things. Talents itself is, is kind of... Um, you know, the abilities. Along, I should have maybe put of abilities there and then put talents and spiritual gifts as the subtitles because our talents and our natural abilities, that's from God in Psalm saying, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. David says, I know that I am fearfully and wonderfully made, that you knit me together in my mother's womb and the days ordained for me are known to you. There's a plan. And God's saying, I know the plans I have for you. The plans to prosper you, give you a hope and a future, not to harm you. And, and so he knits in us, weaving us together that some of us will be athletic and some of us will not. And some of us can sing and some of us cannot. 
And those are physical, natural abilities that, that God gives us for our personal worship. And sometimes that plays out in how we serve in the body as well. But the talents alone do not glorify God because there's a lot of talented people who don't know the Lord. How many professional baseball players are serving the Lord? How many professional football players are serving the Lord? There's quite a few, but there's a lot of guys that are very successful and using great talents that God knit into them in their mother's womb that they don't give a spit about God. So talents alone don't glorify God. But these abilities, these natural abilities that are knit together in us, in the logistical, physical weaving together of us, you are exactly how God wants you. You might have mental development challenges. You might have physical challenges. You are just how God wants you, fearfully and wonderfully made. Don't let Satan tell you because of that, you are not able to glorify God. In fact, in many ways, you're more set up than the rest of us. And then the spiritual, I'm sorry, man, I'm forgetting about my back pain. That lidocaine's starting to work. Shaquille O'Neal's right. No. Shaquille O'Neal didn't work until I started trusting the Lord. Now the Lord is working. So abilities and then spiritual gifts. God's word tells us that spiritual gifts are given to each one of us according to his desire by the Holy Spirit. To be a part of that building us together. Some stones are on the corner some stones are in, certain, are in the archway. They're shaped differently. Some stones are capstones. They're shaped differently for their purpose. And God gives different spiritual gifts. There's not one that every single person has, and there's not, there's not anyone who has all of them. Now, God can empower all of them if it suits his purpose. I've mentioned it before, uh, Peter and John... They just they spoke in tongues as they needed to communicate the language to the to the multiple languages that were there at the time. They communicated the gospel. God enabled them by the power of his Holy Spirit to communicate about Jesus to all this international people to make the church international just like that. And then they come off, and here's this guy at the at the city gate begging, who's been begging there for years, lame, he can't walk. And Peter and John didn't go up to him and speak in tongues to him. Oh, here's Phoenician for you. Oh, you're you're sitting there lame and you, you have a problem. Well, let me speak Phoenician to you. See what we can do? Ha, I'm a man of God. No, the Holy Spirit said, enable them. It says, you step out in faith. Trust me. And they said, rise up and walk. And he rose up and he walked. So he gave them the ability of healing. So we got to believe. And look, I may not be mainly gifted in a certain area, but if God puts me in a situation, I need to trust him to enable me and empower me if I'm faithful. But I also want to know what is that primary gifting that he's given to me that that can be where now that I'm not my own, I've been bought at a price and I belong to a body that's counting on me and that needs me. I want to serve in the way I'm most shaped to serve. God, put me in the right place in your building. As you shape me and mold me and cut me, use me. And he says that these were given each one for the edification of, of the body, that it may built, be built up for body maturation, that we become mature and complete as a body, as God's love manifests itself. See, the natural flow is we get God in our hearts. He changes our hearts with the fruit of the Spirit. From the fruit of the selfish nature, which is division, I don't like the way you do that, I don't like how they, they said this, oh, they, they, their critical spirit, Ugh. And the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kind of, yeah, we need to be patient with each other, even in the body of Christ. But that's the fruit of the Spirit. And as he transforms us inside, then these spiritual gifts come out through us, through the, the, I mean, the spiritual fruit comes out through our spiritual gifts. But if I have the gift of tongues, I use it in the fruit of the Spirit of love. Not in dominance of a public worship service, but if God has a message that he wants me to speak, he's going to enable someone to interpret that, that, that is God's will and his right to do that, and I want to be faithful to that if that's what he's going to do. But Paul had to write to the church, use these gifts in love. If you speak of the tongue of men and angels but have not love, you're just a clanging symbol, making distraction. So make sure it's one at a time with interpretation, no more than three in a service, so that everybody can be blessed. That's using that fruit or that gift of the Spirit in because bathed and coming out of the fruit of the, the gift of the Spirit, being used in the fruit of the Spirit, the love. And discernment. Many of us with discernment are really quick to go and tell people what we're discerning about them, and it's not very loving. 
I've got the gift of discernment, so I'm here to tell you, and you better listen, because the Lord has said, and you just really stinking it up right now faith in your faith. No, fruit of the Spirit, going in a spirit of love and joy and patience, gentleness, with that gift of discernment. Say, I just, I feel like God's telling me something. And I just leave it to you, and I'll be praying for you. Forgive me if it's wrong, but I really feel that this is what God is saying. And if you can use it, God bless you. See a difference? That's fellowship. That's, that's the body coming and being built together and our gifts of the Spirit being used as the avenues through which we manifest the Spirit and our talents and our abilities that God weaves into us can change the ways and the place and the locations and the activities through which we do that. So I, I've been to many events and it's partly why I was trying to train for the Olympics. I felt like God wanted me to be a successful athlete so I could have a venue in the secular world because of my athletic success in the Olympics that I could be at what well, Azusa Pacific has this thing called Night of Champions. And the, these Olympians are there that are Christians and they have a place full of teenagers and they're sharing with them that out of coming out of this Olympics that gets the kids' attention and admiration to a degree, sharing about Jesus Christ and giving them all glory. A gift of preaching that was used in an athletic setting because they were woven as athletes. See, the talent is not all that God's made me to be. My identity is not in my talent. My identity is in Jesus Christ making me like him and his likeness gets to be spilled out through me. The love and the joy and the patience that he's making me like inside like him gets to come out in a venue that he shaped me to be in. Because of my talents and my abilities. It may be the medical field, the medical office, Rebecca. It, it's, it's the House of Blues or whatever venues you play in now, Michelle. Music gets you into music venues. Teaching, Jenny, gets you into secular education with secular educators. Their identity is wrapped in their teaching. And the student's identity is wrapped in their grades and their success. And those things are important, but they have a much higher calling to see who they can be in Christ because God has you there through the talents and abilities and you're there with the fruit of the Spirit flowing out through the gifts of the Spirit in that venue. See how that works? Sorry, absolutely none of that was in my notes. <laughs> Time, talent, and treasure. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. Here it is. It's a part of who we are. It's a major part of who we are. It's the last area that usually that God gets victory over in our lives, in our journey. Because it's so real. <laughs> and, and so scary. And we, we do the checkbook every week. Well, those of us who still have a checkbook... Or those of you who look on your phone at your ba account balance and you go, we got another week of groceries before I get paid again. And it's so there. It's so real. It's so tangible. It, it, it is what it is. You see the bottom line. You see it in black and white. But God knows this is a major avenue and one of the main areas of devoted things in our life. And the two avenues of that are tithe and offerings. Tithe and offerings. Tithe is a 10%. That in Malachi, I know it's Old Testament. We've dealt with this many times. But Jesus himself affirmed it. The disciples, even in the New Testament context, were still tithing at the temple and giving their tenth into the storehouse of their temple while they were faithful with what God had called them to do. And we'll hear about that. But this tenth tithing, storehouse tithing, is that you bring, the, you bring a tenth of what you own, of what I've given you, what I've blessed you with, and it is mine, says the Lord, and you rob me if you don't bring in the whole tenth. So not 9.5%, not 8%, not 5%, not a $20 bill in the vase every Sunday. That is not tithing. Anything short of a tenth is just an offering. And we're, we, we're, gracious, we're, we're grateful for it. We hope it's a part of your growth and your understanding that you can do this. And we're, we're, it's a part of your journey. But I'm here to tell you today that God says you rob me when you don't bring a whole tenth. You, you want me to help you beat I, AI? You want me to help you beat AI? It looks small, but you're keeping some of the devoted things and putting them in with your own possessions. You cannot do that. I will not be with you. 
Did you hear him say that to Israel? Time, talent, and treasure, these are devoted things. Many people say, well, I can't afford to tithe, so I give a lot of time. Okay, great. You're keeping a devoted thing. I don't really think I can do much in the body of Christ that's beneficial, and you're listening to, the, to Satan, the liar, and, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give my tithe, but I don't have to get too much time. I'm paying enough that I don't have to give my time. Here, I'll just put something. I'll put, make sure that I put 10% in the offering every Sunday, and I'm good. No, there's two other devoted aspects of you. Who you are, what you are, and what you have are devoted things as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing unto God. Nothing of you left for you. I'm not getting a lot of amens. But this is God's word. And he says, you rob me, test me in this. One of the only things he says to test me in and see that I won't throw open the floodgates of heaven and you won't have more than you can contain. David, it makes me think of the miracle center. David and Catherine moving here and among us from Uganda. And David being a part of the ministry of the Miracle Center and the power of prayer and the power of healing and deliverance that's taking place there. And God wants to be with us, but he says you've got to be living sacrifices, being faithful with the devoted things. And if I say I'm a devoted follower of Christ, I am a devoted thing. And I can say it all I want, but it's only true if I act like it. And I'll only have victories if I act like it. I will only see God do things that only God can do if I'm devoted. See, they didn't part the water. They parted the water because they were obedient to God and stepped in in a ridiculous obedience that at flood stage would kill them. And they lost to I because God said, I can't be with you. You're withholding from me. You can't stand against your enemies, even a piddly little army that you should take. This is a difficult and a hard but a powerful truth for us. The body of Christ in today's culture is aching. Because of the spirit of Achan among us. And, and so that's the tithe. That's, that's it. First, 10%. God owns that. That's his. It comes in the storehouse. I can't tell the priests who I want them to give it to. You make sure that this goes to that one. That, that's called designated gifts, which are offerings in the church nowadays. And, and, but the tithe is just storehouse. Yeah, you go and you put it in the storehouse. Someone comes and has need. I trust the priest to distribute it. And, and now today, to protect us and protect your perception, I don't handle all that. The church board makes decisions, plans a budget, and, and tries to work and be faithful. And, oh, man, Lord's blessing more. We can extend some of this budget. We can give you a little more here. We've spent 80 grand in air conditioning in the last couple of years. We, God just saved us 30000 more dollars, folks. I don't know if you noticed, but the trees out here on the street... We were going to have to top those off, and it was going to cost us $30,000 because the city makes it our responsibility for trees in our parking strip. Get them out of the power lines and all that. Thirty grand, and we're sitting there going, that's, that, that, that's a staff salary for a year. And the city comes by and says, you know, these tree roots are chomping up the sidewalk, and we're going to remove them all. Oh, there we go. Not only did it save us 30000 but the big sign on that side of the building says, Crossroads Multinational Church in Nazarene can be seen. You can see coming on Delamo, we're not just Sunshine Preschool. We're a church with a preschool. Yeah! <laughs> and so God has been faithfully, as I shared before, he has cut back thousands of dollars a month in our real picture to help us get over this hump, get through the desert, get through the wandering, cross the Jordan together. But he's got a new land for us, and it's a land of abundance. But we've got to be faithfully devoted to him in all that we are and trust him. And we got to be a body that has no Achans or else we'll all be Achan. That's the call. And the more Achans we have among us, the more we are Achan. And can't do things in ministry and can't and have to cut more staff and have to do these things. It's it's, God leaves it that way on purpose. And then the offerings. I, I believe if everybody gave a tenth, we would have the abundance that we need. We'd be able to do so many amazing things. Not only for the financial math, that alone would be amazing what we could do in ministry. 
And if you're new with us, the board decides my salary. I don't sit here and take anything of that. Just in case, our culture and our world and the church has messed this up so much. But God's ordained leadership that is faithful with God's money. But it, not only just the, the human math of everybody doing, because about 15 to 20% of us, I would think, are doing the faithful 10%. That's it. And our sound equipment is dying on us. We're patching it up. We're do, we want to upgrade. We want to modernize the colors in here. We want to do all kinds of things to make us a more efficient tool for ministry in our culture. First and foremost thing that's the most important is getting the Holy Spirit's power full and abundant among us, which happens when we get fully faithful to him. And he becomes the draw. He becomes the one that people come back to see more than what color the walls is. They'll sit in an outdated colored room if the Holy Spirit of God is there. And so that's our first and foremost thing. But isn't it amazing? When we get that way, God enables us to do these other things as window dressing for what he's doing among us and helps us become more efficient in our ministry. God is so good when we get on his plan. He's good anyhow. We get to experience that goodness when we get on his plan. And that not only happens in the church, but that happens in your families. And you take out the human math equation of it, and God's, look, you do that I got some stuff in heaven that's sitting on top of some floodgates here. And you can see how humanly just the math would work. Oh, enjoy, minister, reach my world, take the new land, trust me. And yet as we get more, we're faithful with more, more to be faithful with. And the same principle applies and it becomes a, a mighty force of ministry in our culture. And we get to out of the tithe area and into offerings. As I mentioned, the disciples were still Jews. They still had a temple. They still had the custom of bringing their tithes to the temple, their faithfulness to God. But they were this community of believers. And when you read, when the power of God poured out, they had saved 3,000 people in one day, and the Holy Spirit had poured himself out among them, and they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread, to fellowship, time, talent, and treasure. And none of them claimed anything they had as their own, but as there were needs... From time to time, they would sell land that they owned and bring the proceeds and put it at the apostles' feet, and the apostles would minister to the needs of the community. And nobody had need. It was Christian communism, pardon the term. But that, that was the closest thing to it. Maybe not communism, socialism. I don't know which one would be more accurate, Dave. Socialism. Yeah, communism probably carries way too much of can we rewind the internet live feed? Socialism, okay? And that's not a positive term for us. But it's how God operated and what he called his people to. They were tithing and they were bringing offerings as people had needs, as needs were represented. Today that would be our missionaries are out in the field and we're having to bring some home because we don't have enough. If you can give a little bit of faith promise over and above your tithe, tithe comes to storehouse. If you can give an offering to faith promise, then we can help support our missionaries around the world, people needing the gospel. And these things become offerings that are over and above our tithe, not, well, I'm going to choose to use my tithe for missions because God's given me such a heart for missions. Because then it's not tithe anymore. That's, I'm saying what I want you to do with it. It's not in the storehouse to meet the needs of the ministry of the body. We need it. God calls for it. God commands it. And he says, you rob me if you do not give it to me. And what God says, if I'm a devoted follower of his, what God says, I'm going to do it no matter what effort it takes. You know we used to pass the bags in front of you and say, here, we'll make it real easy. Put your tithes and offerings right there. You don't have to do anything. We'll come right by and pass a bag in front of you. Do, 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 do. Isn't that nice? And it is nice, and it is a part of worship, and that's why many people want us to do it, is so that we can be worshiping God in this context. But worshiping God is a heart that's going to be faithful no matter what it takes to be faithful. And if that bag isn't coming in front of me and i got to walk 10 feet or five feet out of my way to the door to put something in a vase, God says to do it. I'm not going to stop doing it because, well, that's not as easy as it used to be. We could put the vase up on top of the building. If God said do it, we better find a way to do it. And you know how he'd bless? Come on, folks, we're not playing church. We're the body of Christ in a world that needs him desperately. 
They're dying in their addictions. They're dying in their drugs. They're dying in their sex. They're dying in their self-absorption and going to hell in a handbasket. You want hellfire and brimstone from this pastor? Boom. And we're sitting here complaining about some of these things. Music style, alt offering vases. Oh man, I feel like I'm yelling at you. I want you to know, I'm only doing this because I trust you guys. We have a wonderful church here and I am so excited and believing what God wants us to do and we got to get this crud out of the way. That's all. We are a good people with good hearts and so much potential that will be for you and for your children in the new land of abundance when we trust God and become fully devoted to Him no matter what it takes. And again, it's not one of these in lieu of the other. They're all, all of me is devoted things. Not that this part, I'll devote this part because I can't afford to devote this part. Hmm? What you keeping? That's in your tent. You're putting it among your possessions. Here's how we tend to do that. And here I've got for you. <laughs> I was forgetting that it's feeling really, but it's loosened up quite a bit. I think I've been moving a lot. Uh-oh, pastor's got a knife. Look out. Yes, I'm going to have you come up family by family, and we're going to see if you're keeping devoted things. And if you are, come on, we're just going to slit your throat right here. And, you know, so you ready? We're going to do what Aiken, or what Joshua did. You ready? Come on, family by family, present. No, I'm, okay, just kidding. That's right, we're New Covenant people, right? Yes, okay. Can you imagine? We talk about money in church and people are like, oh, you know, I show up and they're talking about money again. Yeah, it's all the church is about. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, we'll be thankful we're not Joshua and... <laughs> okay. Got some apples here, some fruit from our crops. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten apples. This is our month's crop from our... It's our harvest for the month. They may vary in size depending on family to family, how much you got, how big the apples are, and, and it may not be 10. And these ratios aren't going to be really like dead down accurate. But just to give us an illustration here, we make 10 apples a month. And, and you know what? Before you even start thinking about what God wants you to do, the government takes 20% of your tithe. I mean 20% of your apples. It's taken out of your check. You're, you're told you're paid this much. But the government takes out whew, at least two between all the taxes that you pay. So you got 20% gone. Let's not put it on the altar because that's, <laughs> I don't know where to set it. Well, you guys just know they're gone, okay? Pretend those aren't there. And, and okay, so taxes come off the top. But in the, you know, in the, also one of my patterns during the month is, you know, I go to Starbucks three times a week or so, swing through on my way to work, and they're about four bucks for a Starbucks. That's about 12, 13 bucks a, a week. So let's just say 15 bucks a week at four weeks. That's, you know, 60 bucks. So, you know, I'm going to take 60 bucks out of this apple here. I need, I just, it's my Starbucks, man. I'm, I, I got I to have my Starbucks. I'll get in the office. Oh, if I don't have my Starbucks. So, okay. So, okay, all right, so we're living through our month. And then, oh, you know, we've got to pay our mortgage. <laughs> got to pay our mortgage. Da, 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 Oh, <laughs> oh now i got to pick it up. Oh, boy, yep, yeah, I'm much better. I couldn't do that this morning. All right. So, take three of those for mortgage. Oh, but wait, you know what else? You know, one of these weeks, we just, and there was a family going out. We decided to go out to eat dinner with them. As a family, conservatively, it was 50 bucks for dinner. It's such a cheap dinner. You got a family of four. Maybe we should take out another 20. Oh, these are good. Okay. And um, so then, all right, oh, yeah, but you know what? How many of you got a car payment? That's probably one of these. So... That's a lot easier to juggle than three, so we'll, good thing I don't have anything that takes four. All right. So our car payment. And, you know, family time is important. And, you know, once a month, it's not that bad to go to the movies, buy some concessions, but that's about as much as a car payment these days. To get popcorn for everybody, 10 bucks a ticket, four, kids in the, four people in the family, you go to a matinee, maybe seven or eight bucks a ticket, but your concessions are $20,000 for a small popcorn. You know what I'm saying. So, you know, you spend out of these 10 in your month's provision and, and you go to the movie. That's a wonderful thing. And family's important, right? The church says family's important. God's word says family's important, right? It is. Okay. So, you know, real, no problem. Oh, I got to pay insurance on my car and my home. 
my dog, my shoes. No reaction on paying insurance on your shoes. Maybe uh, my wife must be unique in that. No, I'm just kidding. We know. <laughs> Can we rewind that web casting one more time? Okay, all right. Okay. I'm telling her she's got to come. <laughs> so the insurances that we have to pay. And you know what? We live in Southern California, and we live by Disneyland, and some of us have passes. We're paying monthly payments on these passes, so we got to pay our monthly payment for the pass. Or we're going to Knott's Berry Farm because we can't afford Disneyland, so we, we buy the tickets into Knott's Berry Farm, and we buy food in the park, and, and we go to Knott's Berry Farm. A family event, hey, you know, once a month, that's pretty cool. That's not bad. We're, we're a cool family. The kids think we're cool. All right. They like seeing Dad riding on Snoopy at Camp Snoopy, so that, that's really fun. But that's about $200 being gracious. Oh, and groceries, my goodness, you got to eat during the month, right? So you got groceries, it's at least one of these things, if you're feeding the family especially. And so there's your month picture. And the church is preaching, well, you got to give a tenth to God. Well, I'm sorry, God. I can't afford to give you a tenth. I can't give you the whole tithe. See, some of it got put into my possessions. Some of it's been absorbed into my tent by the choices that I've made through the week. Sorry. Oh, these are great things, but God, I did it with my family. Your word tells me to be with family. I'm being obedient, and God's going, <clears throat> you think you're fooling me? You rob me. And so... For us, humanly speaking, the best thing for us to do, and it also involves trust and faith in God, we take those ten and we understand the principle called first fruits. Jericho was the first city they took. All this resource that they could use to advance God's army, to advance God's people. Come on, God, this is ridiculous to ask us to give all that stuff to you. Look at all the weapons and manpower we could have and animal power we could have. The donkeys could pull carts and weaponry and, and man, God, that don't make no sense. And God says, eh, that's the first thing you got. You got all these other things. Just trust me. Devote it to me and trust me. And do not fear, for I will be with you wherever you go. And so they had to be first fruits, which simply means Amy sits down, the first check she writes, Crossroads Multinational Church of the Nazarene. 10% of what I am getting and 10% of her income, as soon as she gets her paychecks, the first thing she writes, 10% goes to our storehouse so that there may be food for everybody. So there may be a youth pastor. So there may be a children's pastor. So there may be an updated environment. So there may be an effective place of worship and power. But most importantly, because I belong to God and that's what he tells me to do, and so we do it. And when I first started doing something at Westchester where we didn't pass the offering plates, but we had a basket in the back, and now we have the, those vases, and some of you think that they're attractive and some of you do not. It's okay. It looks more, just so you know, it looks more like the biblical vases that they used. They had fluted brass things in a big, big box. That, you know, so just, they're biblical. So leave me alone. <laughs> Is it really? Okay, all right. Um, <laughs> what was I saying? <laughs> oh, you know, there was something that felt fulfilling. And this is just me. That I, you know, had to go back and say, you know what? I am taking effort to be faithful to God. And it doesn't matter if people see me do it or not. I used to think, you know what, we need to pass the plates because I sit up front and the people need to see that the pastor's faithful and the pastor tithes too. And there was too much concern about what people saw in me. And, and sometimes that's the concern that some others feel, that they give out of obligation. I'm sitting here, maybe I'm, I'm a first-time visitor and they're passing these bags and these, these intimidating men in suits are standing there looking at me like this as they're waiting for the bag to come. And as a visitor, I sat on the end so I could get out quickly if I needed to. If pastor's preaching on money... <laughs> I better, uh, I better put some money in. And the usher goes, oh, I better put some more in. No, I'm just kidding. Our ushers do not do that. It'd be funny though, wouldn't it? 
I, my wife went to a, a, an, another ethnic congregation, and, and they passed all the offering, and it was with energy and, and, and power, and it was an ordination service. And at the end of the service, the pastor came and said, our, our ushers counted the offering, and you folks didn't give enough, and they passed the bags again. <laughs> and they had the same energy and the same joy. and said, okay, good enough, go home. I'd be looking for another church if I tried that here. But, you know, there was something fulfilling about, I have to take some effort. I have to be intentional to go and do what God's called me to do. And I know that it's not intimidating someone else. Five bucks of cash given by a visitor that's given out of obligation could be a negative mark that makes them not want to come back and hear the gospel of Jesus and be discipled with us in American culture. Because that's how America thinks the church is. But that's what we're all about. And we strong arm you with a little soft velvety bag <laughs> coming in front of you. But that tent is done. It's gone. And you know what? I still have the mortgage. I still have the taxes. These things, they don't change. Car payment, groceries. I don't remember what all else we had. What do we have? Insurances. We still have all those. And you know what? God got his. And, and it may be, you know, well, you, what are you saying, Pastor? We can't ever do anything fun with our kids. We can't ever do, well, let's see. Movies and a popcorn. How about a DVD and home pop popcorn? For 12 bucks total instead of a movie night every week. You got to have Starbucks before you go in to build the office or you're just dead tired. How about making a good old cup of joe at home and taking a travel mug and going into your office with your coffee? But God gets his. You still get coffee. It's not Starbucks. But you still get coffee. You still have movie and popcorn with your kids and your family. How about um, going out to dinner? Can we never go out to dinner? Sometimes you can look. But you know what? That all now fits in the context of God's got his. We know these are going to this. And look, we can still go out to dinner this month. Maybe. If not, dinner at home, a little creativity with the kids. Wonderful night, much more affordable. Can't go to amusement park? Cerritos has some of the best free parks to go to, Heritage Park. Kids will have as much fun. They go to Disneyland, we spend a bunch of money to get in, they go to the playground and play. Like they, excuse me, like they could do at home. They find the play equipment and go climbing on it. Go, we could have gone to Heritage Park. Right? Bottom line is, God gets his. And I'm faithful. And we have a better way of budgeting. You know, I really like my Starbucks. Is there a way I can carve this down a little bit? And we humanly manage the other nine because it's what we've got to deal with. But when we look, and what we've got to remember is all of it is his. I can't go and spend this one on pornography. Well, I gave my tenth to God so I can use mine on pornography. No, it's not yours. This is God's too. What is he going to spend it on? What choices are you going to make with what you think is yours? The leftovers aren't yours. And sometimes God says, faith promise is coming. We need to support our missionaries. And if you obey him, I was wondering, it worked out that I didn't need this extra apple, but I just realized God has more. We obey him. He'll take care of us. And we will then walk in things that only God can do. When we look at what we can do with what we've got, guess what we enjoy? What we can do. Sometimes that's pretty cool. But that's the limit. That's the cap. We will never walk in a victory and a power that God alone can provide until we put ourselves in position that that's what we need him to do. And we're faithful. The body's aching. Because of Achan, the spirit of Achan among, <laughs> Achan among us. And to stop the Achan, we must stop the Achan. Heavenly Fathers, we come and we're going to make this personal. We'll look at our bookmarks and ask ourselves today, what are my withheld devoted things? 
Am I one who's tithing and so I don't think I have to do anything else, but I'm withholding my spiritual gifts, my ability, my time and the fellowship with the body? Is it my talent? Is it my abilities? I don't have time to serve, so I tithe. Or is it I have time to serve, and it's a good thing. That's, that's kind of my tithe. I give my time free, and it should be worth this much. Well, see, that's designating what your gift goes to. It, it goes to you <laughs> and forces us to pay you for what you're doing in the body because that, it's not in the storehouse. It's you deciding that the value, a gift in kind, that's not storehouse. That doesn't, I mean, your service helps others, but others are going hungry. So only you consider before the Lord now as one who's saying you're a devoted follower of Christ and answer the question, are you? Lord, am I? Lord, what are my devoted things that I'm withholding from you? I've had all kinds of good reasons, but Lord, your word does not make any excuses. Help us to not take the devoted things and put them among our possessions. And Lord, as this good people of crossroads steps out in faithfulness in the floodgates of heaven, begin to bless us abundantly. Help us remember to continue to be faithful with every ounce of it. For you will be with us. We will not have to fear as we devote ourselves to you. While, while we're in this moment of prayer, will you write down what God has said to you or your devoted things, your withheld devoted things? What have you been keeping in your tent? Are you robbing him because you're not giving a tenth? Right off the bat. I don't know what it is. But when we all shut the mouth of Satan by our faith in Christ, who tells each one of us he cherishes us for the body and he's gifted us, and if we let him shape us, he'll build us together into a holy, mighty building, a priesthood of the living God in a dying world. And nothing will be able to stop us. I desire that for my kids to be in a church that they see that. I desire that for this good people who have served you, many sitting in here all their life and have seen this church go through its ups and downs. But we stand here as the next gen, together, new faces, veteran faces among us. We are here together for you calling us right here, right now, to be the faithful people of God, to take the pagan land for you. Call us our God. Call us, and may we submit these devoted things to you. I leave this message with your spirit. No, no request for raised hands, but just a moment of silence. <clears throat> You're standing before the throne room of God that through the blood of Christ, he says, you can approach my throne room with confidence. But as we approach, knowing that we can, we know that he sees under our tent. He knows. Achan did not confess until God told Joshua, Israel's been unfaithful. They've put the devoted things with their own possessions. Lord, I want each person in each home in this place to walk in the abundance of the floodgates of heaven. It may not be financial floodgates, but your floodgates are the best. Your daily provision, your presence, your power for victory over addictions, sinful patterns. Oh, Lord, the floodgates take many forms. I desire that for this people that you have given me the privilege of being with. I love them, Father. And yes, unfaithfulness is hindering the body, which then hinders my work, frustrates my work. But it's nothing personal. 
I want it for each individual first. And I just know that a body full of individuals that are faithful becomes a body that you are with and nothing stops. And so God, as we close this time together, may your Holy Spirit take it and minister to each one. Speak to each one of us according to our needs. Forgive us. Forgive our unbelief. Someone said to Jesus, forgive my unbelief. I do believe. Lord, let us come to you and say, forgive my unbelief. I'm going to move forward in belief. And I'm going to be a devoted follower of yours with all that I am. The enemy is going to want to try to put fear in the mix. The enemy might even try to stir some circumstance that, well, can't start this week and I have to wait another week. No. Nothing is going to stop me. God, you're first. Something else will have to suffer. Because if you suffer, then that something else has become more important than you and that is an idol. I will have no other gods before you, Lord. You alone are our God. You provide out of your power and glory. We want nothing but you with us, and we want to walk as a church in the results that only God with us can produce. We praise you in advance. In the name of your Holy Son, Jesus, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, amen. Let's stand and sing with hearts of integrity and sincerity to God who is our God. Water you turn into wine Open the eyes of the blind There's no one like you Hold on one second Let's try that again <laughs> Water you turn into wine Who opened the eyes of the blind There's no one like you There's none like you Into the darkness you shine And out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you There's none like you Our God is greater, and our God is stronger. And God, you are higher than any other. And our God is healer, and awesome in power. Our God, our God. Into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we rise And there's no one like you There's no one like you Let's sing it, our God is greater and Our God is greater and Our God is stronger and God, you are higher than any other and Our God is healer And our sovereign power Our God, our God Let's sing that again our God is greater, our God is stronger, God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome power, our God, our God. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand in day? I said, if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us?
Amen. Go in peace this week. Have a blessed week.